you know, one of my favorite stories is I believe it was probably 2008 because I think there was a World Cup going on at the time was the ESPN Spelling Bee when Pinnacle put it up one time. I mean, I sat there the day before, I watched the preliminaries, felt I'd done pretty good form on it and I did pretty well out of it. I mean, betting 50 and 100 limits. Uh, I think I won about 10 or 12,000 betting on, you know, will the winner wear glasses or all these kind of things. That's Adam Bjorn, and he is one of the sharpest bookmakers in the world. I recently sat down with Adam to find out how he got started in the sports betting business, what he thinks of the current industry, and how he does what he does, which is book some of the biggest bets in the world. I think you'll find this conversation pretty interesting. But before we dive into that, do me a favor and tap that like button. That helps promote the video, and if you enjoyed it, well, click subscribe. Oh, if you're new here, I'm Captain Jack from unabated.com, and I make authentic content about sports betting. And it'll either help you on your journey to either win more or perhaps lose less. Anyway, enough about me. Let's get back to Adam. So I gather by your voice that you are from Australia. Correct. And uh, can you give me a little bit of background as to what it was like coming up in Australia? How did you develop this love for sports betting? And uh, where did that develop along the way? Yeah, so when it comes to uh, betting, gambling, I started uh, very young. Uh, I was probably betting on horses anywhere from sort of eight to 10 years old. Um, you know, my dad bet dogs and horses and things like that. Uh, used to have some trotters or harness runners. Um, and I just sort of gravitated to it. Uh, you know, I'd get the Friday paper doing the Saturday form for the big Melbourne races. You know, our, what you would call uh, OTB, which are our TABs, uh, was actually in the back of a sports store uh, when I was younger. So it was, you know, I was able to access it. Um, and, you know, occasionally I'd get to put through my own tickets and things like that. Um, the first sports bet that I really remember was actually uh, George Foreman versus Michael Moore. Uh, it was like November, just after I turned 18. Uh, sports betting was in a couple of states in Australia uh, in 94. You know, I think uh, Foreman was like eights or tens for a KO and probably four to one to win or something like that. Um, so I you know, went to the Melbourne Casino, opened up an account. Again, probably bet 50 or or $100 or something like that on it. And then to get the results in those days, I remember the old Teletext TVs which I always had one in my room for the horse, the horse feeds to get the results and the, and the odds and stuff like that. Uh, and that was kind of finding out a day later, you know, that George had won that fight at a, at a big underdog price. And I remember, you know, I actually backed a guy 1995 in the, in the masters a guy named Eldrick Woods. Um, <laughs> and I must, I must think when I go home next time and I haven't been home for a bit over a decade, whether I have that ticket somewhere or, or something like that, because, uh, you know, obviously, he turned into, you know, probably one of the two greatest golfers ever. Um, and it sort of gravitated from there. When did you discover that you could beat sports betting or that you thought you could beat sports betting? Did that happen right away when that George Foreman ticket won? Um, or? No, not at all. It was uh, So when you get into this industry, uh, you know, like how people come up with numbers and that. When I first started this Sports Bet Australia... So it was a Sunday afternoon, all the rugby and all the Aussie rules games were done and they'd sit in a circle, everyone would give their numbers and we'd pick each other off. Well, you know, I was quickly getting picked off uh, and I was quite happy to sort of put my numbers out there and let people bet into them. And, and that's the way I learned was, you know, getting picked off by guys 20, 30 years older than me that had been doing this for a lot longer. But it soon turned out that, you know, I was quickly picking them off. They didn't want to bet with me on Sundays. And then while I was there, a guy come out uh, and set up, well, which eventually turned into CanBet, but he was doing US sports, which was kind of new out there and, and no one really understood it. But what I found was that all the, the Australian books that did exist were getting numbers that were a day old. So I was getting real time numbers and being able to just pick them off, uh, you know, there was sometimes 
a line on an NBA game would go from, you know, eight and a half the day before, which again, back then it was the sports network or something like that that people were pulling numbers from. And the number would be three and a half, you know, three, something like that. And you'd be getting nine to two, five to one, the dog. And, you know, you just jump into those and occasionally you'd hit some. And that really sort of just what built up the bankroll in the beginning. Adam quickly moved on from just picking off stale lines to putting in the time, effort, and more importantly, the tenacity to become a winning better. And just, I was doing the work. I mean, I was working, you know, 14, 16 hours a day, sort of doing information. I was generally working for a book at the time. I was in Darwin first, and then Canbet sort of moved to Canberra. And inside the, uh, the betting ring in Canberra, there was probably like eight sports books. Uh, you know, I worked for one of them for a day uh, on a Saturday and that sort of, I lived at their big house. So that paid me rent, you know, I'd sort of work at other ones just to pick up some money and whatnot. But it was pretty soon that I'd be calling the book and they'd be hold the number and you'd be on hold for two or three minutes and then they'd come back. And then, you know, then you'd start asking for 10 games when you knew you only wanted one or two. Um, so it was really a game and I, and I, I built up, I guess, a bit of a reputation uh, and, and I was probably a bit of an asshole at the time as well. I mean, I was sort of really digging it into them as hard as I could and had no empathy for the books at all. Get the information that I could and, and push it as hard as, as I could. Like I wasn't playing a percentage of my bankroll or anything like that. I was laying it out. I was every week I was laying out everything I had in my bank account plus whatever <laughs> credit I could get or whatever else. And I was just rolling with it week to week. That's that's impressive that you stuck around that long with with that strategy. But hey, there's there's no there's nothing better than hard work, and that you know clearly shows. The Australian sports betting scene was diverse, and Adam thrived. However, he could see the market closing in on him. When I was coming up, they were real bookies. I mean, you know, the guys at the track, you know, um, taking the horses, they'd take big exposure. And it was really the horse guys that were getting into the sports betting, seeing that this was the new frontier, you know, and then you get the, the whole idea back then was they were attacking the Asian market as well. You know, the, the companies on in Darwin and stuff like that were really trying to get into Singapore, Hong Kong and, and draw some of that business in as well. And then sort of I left in 2000 and it was still, you could still get a bet on. It was not as, not as easy. Um, you know, you, I played the same games that everyone else does. Mum opened an account, you know, friends and, and things like that. But it's all now Bet365. Ladbrokes bought a couple of the locals. Paddy Power bought a couple of the locals. Um, I think there's maybe sort of 20, 25 uh, books there now, but there's really sort of three or four, kind of the way the Vegas went, you know, in the sort of middle of the thousands or a decade ago. And it's really, I mean, I, I hear the complaints all the time from guys like I can't get a bet on. And then in more recent years, the Australian government really started to go after, you know, foreign bookmakers, international ones, offshore, those kind of things. Around the year 2000, Adam decided that in order to have a future in the sports betting industry, he was going to have to leave Australia. I was at a, living at a friend's apartment in Melbourne and I emailed, I think about 150 sports books around the world. And within about 48 hours, uh, a friend of a friend called and said, did you just fly to, you know, uh, Olympic sports in the Jamaica? And I said, yeah, I think that was one of them. Um, he said, I know the guy. I've been doing some golf for him. Um, he's interested in getting on a phone. So I spoke to him. We agreed on money. At that time, the Aussie dollar to the US dollar was like two and a half to one. So I was like, you know, it was great out the box. And then, you know, within two weeks, I was living in Jamaica. While working at Olympic, Adam quickly identified how the market here was different from the other markets he had seen so far. Working in multiple markets allowed him to see where the inefficiencies were. It was some pros and cons of what I saw of how they operate. I really understood that uh, betting second halves was going to be something easy to do because I saw how the numbers were made. And this was pre, you know, anybody actually trying to work out what the second half number should be. Um, it was just based off what's the score, uh, what was the closer, you know, make it this. So I really quickly, again, having done US sports in Australia and then doing European sports uh, in Jamaica, it also was the weaker components of sports books. 
you know, the, the offshores, the UK books um, were generally weak on what weren't their main customer base. So the Pinnacles, the Olympics and that were very weak on golf, tennis, soccer, you know, handball, volleyball, all these kind of things. And then the UK books were very weak on US sports. And I was sort of sitting in the, the middle of all that, understanding this uh, sort of very early and then just, again, going to work of picking all the weak spots. Do you think that inefficiencies still exist in terms of the European books maybe being weaker on the US sports and the offshores maybe being weaker on European sports? Is, does that inefficiency still exist or are we more yeah, of a it's, global market? It, it still exists. I mean, it, it's tightened up a little bit in more recent years. I mean, even in the last five, 10 years, um, you know, there's a lot of books uh, aren't automated. So, you know, though, it, you know, companies like Intralot were just plugging numbers into Jamaican local sports books uh, and things like that. And again, one of the things that I, I fell into early was a lot of these European books didn't like half, didn't like flat numbers. So, you know, going back to the 2000 Super Bowl, um, I literally bet my whole bankroll, half of it on minus six and a half, uh, the Rams, half of it at plus seven and a half, the Titans, and obviously it fell seven. But this was one thing where I learned, you know, the threes, the three and a halves, the two and a halves, even paying, you know, an extra 10 cents and that when it should have been 30, 40 cents and things like that was, was really a weak spot. And they don't show up as much now, um, but there's still a lot of inefficiencies in, in a lot of sports. I, I think UFC is probably a really good one right now. There's good volume on it. Uh, no one's really got any idea what the number should be or, what, or where it's going. But it's something that you can get down for. So, I mean, I think it's a sport that if you're just getting into it and you know it, um, it's really worthwhile spending your time on that. And then when they try and do live, uh, they've got no idea. And I've seen it, you know, for years. I've just tried to, if I've ever booked the live UFC, um, really just finding the arbitrages and, and letting them go to town between, you know, wherever I was or whatever I was doing versus other books. Uh, because boxing and UFC, when it comes to live, it's not even close uh, to being a good product from a bookmaker's standpoint. After working at Olympic for a year, Adam moved on to a couple other books in the Caribbean, and he realized this business of betting and booking sports was his life calling. You work some long, hard hours uh, in this business, you know, and that's what I've just gravitated towards and, and really enjoyed it. You know, a lot of people ask me what I do, and it's more who I am. I mean, this is who I am. I am this industry. I am a you know gambler, punter, bookie, whatever it is. Eventually, Adam's path took him back to Jamaica, where he started looking into the regulated betting market in that country. And then his path crossed with legendary sports betting operator, Bet Chris. And then I started digging into the Jamaican, um, you know, th there was a betting and gaming. I didn't realize there was local licensing. So I'd actually made a trip to Costa Rica to actually look for software for what I was going to use in Jamaica. Um, and sort of, you know, one thing led to another and uh, I met the guys from Bet Cruz. You know, I was sort of doing some consulting in the industry as well, you know, trying to help uh, others sort of tackle those foreign markets. I finally got through with the license and I said, well, that's it. I'm going back to Jamaica to do this. And they sort of threw up the idea, well, why don't you use the brand, you know, do some kind of franchise deal or something like that. And again, you know, I was playing some poker games in Kingston and in Jamaica and, and, the, and the brand resonated with these guys. You know, oh, I saw that in a magazine when we were flying to such and such one time or something like that. Um, so it made sense. And they'd been out of the US market for some years now, which sort of helped the process of, I'd really started to head in that direction of making sure, you know, doing the, if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it properly. Um, the due diligence, the compliance, the... AMLs, all those kind of fun things that none of us enjoy, but that's just the direction that everything's going these days. And then just sort of started doing that, uh, offering fixed odds on local Jamaican horses, um, which no one had ever sort of done before. Uh, it was a very old English bookie culture. Um, so people knew what bookmakers were and they understood um, that component of it. And I also just, I mean, I can sit there and drink a red stripe with a guy betting 50 cents or a dollar and I can go to dinner with guys that are wanting to bet six figures and things like that. It's just, again, 
more who I am than what I do. And uh, I just gravitated to it. And, and I'm, you know, I'm quite happy getting on the phone with customers and, you know, and, and trying to teach them a bit as well, trying to teach them to arbitrage, something that I got to take advantage of, you know, from the late 90s. That got me thinking. What advice would Adam give to someone who wants to make it in sports betting, either as a professional better or as a bookmaker? I think if you really want to get into this, whether you're a gambler or want to get on the bookmaking side, you have to be open to literally, you know, picking up and going anywhere. Find where your edges are, um, whether it's going to Jamaica and picking off the local books. Um, you know, you could make a good uh, six-figure living off that if you if you really um, picked your spots, disciplined and patience and stuff like that. And then on top of that, you, you're arbing and going betting into other European or, or whatever else. You know, if you want to be on the on the betting side, look for those soft spots. You know, if you have a bit of an expertise, and I, and I know there's a lot of people out there and UFC and boxing is kind of a funny one. If you really have an idea of how to price something and get someone good to teach you how to price um, and then sort of grow from that, be willing to sort of stick your neck out and, and take a few licks, you know, Learn, learn the hard way. I think that's probably the best way to do it at times because you just educate yourself a bit more. Again, worked for a place a few years ago. Uh, Tiger Woods wins Masters. Well, I'm going to lose that every time that happens in you know the past number of years. Uh, had a really, really solid beating uh, on that one, but I'm at a point now where that that was that happened. So we come back. Woodland in the U.S. Open. I win all what I'd lost on the Masters back for the for the house I was dealing with, and then come the British Open, Larry won all that again. So it's being able to do that. Uh, you're not going to get to DraftKings and they say go for it, roll the dice. You know, like uh, we trust your opinion and things like that. That's not going to happen. So you've really got to decide what your objectives. You know, find out whether there's someone out there. And I'm open to, to taking on really any conversation, picking up a phone with someone, wanting to sort of see how to get into it. Um, you know, I look around now and there's a lot of guys, and I listen to different uh, YouTubes and, and Clubhouse and things like that, you know, guys that have models and really want to try and break into it. Um, you know, those kind of guys, I've been, I've gotten into rooms with lots of times and you know three out of ten of ones that I end up doing work with and things like that um, so it's really first what what are your plans and what do you want to get out of it and then two you know where in the world can you achieve that and then just attack it I mean just go after it Adam has seen it all bet it all and booked it all so are there any sports that he still likes to bet on you know, one of my favorite stories is I believe it was probably 2008 because I think there was a World Cup going on at the time was the ESPN Spelling Bee when Pinnacle put it up one time. <laughs> I mean, I sat there the day before I watched the preliminaries and I felt I'd done pretty good form on it and I did pretty well out of it. I mean, betting 50 and 100 limits. Uh, I think I won about 10 or 12,000 betting on, you know, will the winner wear glasses or all these kind of things. Now, you know, looking back on those times of the Little League World Series and all those kind of things, I'm glad that they don't bet on those things anymore. Um, I think that's the right direction that they've taken in, in really restricting and getting on top of those things. Um, but big horse races, um, you know, Kentucky Derby, Triple Crown, Breeders' Cup, those kind of things, because, again, um, I guess it's just my, my passion of the horse racing side of things. Uh, and then golf. I mean, I, you know, grew up playing golf, um, you know, Sunday afternoon, I'm quite happy sitting there, whether it's the, the booking or the betting live, um, you know, with, with Betfair and these things um, sort of for the past 10, 15 years where you can really trade like you're trading stocks. Um, that has been a great advantage uh, for a lot of people um, that really are wanting to just trade and, and, bet heavy, knowing there's an over, um, and then being able to get out of it at times and, and really extending yourself, knowing that you can, you know, get coverage and, and things like that later on. But yes, Sunday afternoon, especially majors, I mean, you 
know, Sunday afternoon in the majors, uh, after literally I've probably done, you know, a hundred plus hours already, um, a good Sunday afternoon battle, uh, is as probably good as a, a big close horse race um, is where I'm at at this stage in, in my career of, of the betting and the bookmaking uh, aspect of it. Coming up in part two, Adam and I discuss how he handles sharp players. Uh, so I'm gonna kind of go through a range uh, of sharp moves over the next couple minutes here. And I want you to give me your feedback on what you do to counteract that or to adjust for it. And also, you know, which ones are you just not tolerant of? 